sir. About 25 minutes, right? Right, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And, you know, we today we have such a special guest, Drew Hayden Taylor. Um, I was just talking to him in the back room that, you know, I've been following his career ever since he was just a young guy. Um, and he's still young. Um, but, you know, we've had, you know, nothing but, you know, excellent writing from you, um, from a playwright to books to, uh, you know, even your documentary that has been viewed so many times on, on CBC as well as now it's being put in our schools. We have some teachers that are that are um, teaching your book or reading your book, uh, Motorcycles and Sweetgrass, um, Indians and Cottagers, and that really created an awful lot of, um, stirred an awful lot of conversations because we know where you're talking about. Um, as well as, uh, you know, the, the documentary, you know, and so we're just, and the humor that you have, like we're just so thrilled and honored, you know, because this whole speaker series has been about, um, you know, medicine, uh, humor is medicine. And, uh, and even though we have those trying times in our own lives, you know, when we have those good belly laughs, that's also medicine. So we're just so thrilled and honored, Drew, um, that you're here with us today. And, you know, and if you can just speak to, you know, what got you started, um, where some of your stories come from, um, who inspires you, and even touch a little bit about um, Cottagers and Indians, as well as your documentary. So, yeah, you have uh, you, you have the floor. Take it away. Thank Welcome. you very much. And it's such a delight to be here. Hopefully, I'll sound somewhat interesting. Um, well, as you heard, my name is Drew Hayden Taylor, and I'm one of those rare breeds of animals you'll come across occasionally called a um, professional writer. That is to say, I do not have a day job. I do not spend my afternoons saying, would you like fries with this? Um, but, more, but more than anything, I think of myself as a contemporary storyteller. And when I say contemporary storyteller, I mean the fact that in the 21st century, there's so many different ways to tell stories. It used to be way back when you told all stories were told orally across a campfire, across a kitchen table or whatever. And then there was print stories were told through print and then there was theater and then there was radio and then there was television and then there was movies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And today there's so many different ways to tell stories. Even video games have intricate and detailed narratives within them. So when I say I'm a contemporary storyteller, I talk about how many different ways there are to tell stories and how much I try and embrace them and have fun with them. Um, I'm a playwright. I am a novelist. I write short stories. Uh, I am a journalist. I am a filmmaker. I've written a graphic novel. I do documentaries. I've done just about everything in the world of storytelling television. Um, and I'm always looking for new ways to tell stories. That's part of the fun. Now, uh, as you heard, I'm from a place called Curve Lake, which is a small Anishinaabe reserve about half an hour north of Peterborough, Ontario. And I grew up there. I am, um, I grew up there with my mother. I'm a single child of a single parent. But at the same time, I come from both a big and a small family. I come from a big family because my mother was the oldest of 14. So I have a gajillion first cousins, second cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. cetera. Uh, that's what used to happen before they had the internet. Um, but I also come from a small family, a single child of a single mother. And my mother blames that on the fact that when I was born, I was 11 pounds, 13 ounces. So anyways, growing up in Curve Lake, like any small town, any reserve anywhere, any small town, it was kind of boring. We got three television stations, which at most of the time, and all the older people who are listening will understand this. And the younger people, if you don't understand this, ask one of the older people. All three of the television stations we got frequently were very, very snowy. Um, so I got bored easy, right? I was only so many times you can go swimming, so many trees you can climb. So I read a lot. I loved reading. So I was this little native kid out in the middle of nowhere, and I'd be reading these stories of exotic places um, um, all over the world where interesting things happened. And it, I thought it would be so cool to go to these places. And wasn't it cool that I could read about them here on my reserve? And wouldn't it be just as cool if someday I could write stories about my community and send them out to the world, never thinking this would happen. But 
as time went by, I began to discover things about the wonderful world of reading and later writing. The more I read, the more I discovered I wanted to be a writer. I liked I liked the fact that being a writer, you got to create entire universes out of your imagination. And early in my career as a writer, I discovered that the universe I created as a writer, I had more control over that than I had in the universe I lived in. So I liked that. So uh, the more I read, the more I wanted to be a writer. And, but unfortunately, when I'm old enough to know that when I was, I was old, old enough that when I wanted to be a writer, I was very conscious of the fact that, at least to me, I didn't know of any other Native writers. This was way before the internet and way before they taught any Indigenous literature in schools. So I'm there and I'm thinking, maybe is there a point in me wanting to be a writer? Because I wasn't aware of any Native people who were writing. And I would decide to ask two people. Uh, I did, well, I did what El, uh, Native people have done for a long time. I went to elders seeking wisdom, knowledge, and guidance. The first person I went to was my grade 11 English teacher. Uh, we were we were um, we went to school on the reserve for two, three years, and then we were bused to a nearby town to go to go to grades um, three and up. So I was asking my grade 11 English teacher, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And my grade 11 English teacher said, no, not really. And that stayed with me. Next person I asked was my mother. I went to my mother and I asked my mother, is it pop, um, told my mother that I wanted to be a writer. And my mother looked at me with a very perplexed look saying, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. And I knew where my mother was coming from. My mother had a grade six education. She only spoke in Anishinaabe, not only spoke, that was her first language. And she'd spent like 20, 30, 40 years cooking and cleaning essentially for white people. So the idea of being a writer was just literally not on her radar. So that stayed with me. So I gave up wanting to be a writer. But the thing was, I liked the arts. I liked the fact that you, th this was a whole group of people who could create art out of nothing, out of sheer imagination. So I, went, I ended up leaving the reserve to go to college. I took radio and television broadcasting. And then I ended up kicking around Toronto for a number of years um, in my early 20s looking for work. So as I said, I knew I wasn't meant to be an artist, but I wanted to hang out with artists or hang out in the arts. To me, I did not want to end up in a cubicle. And so I um, ended up working in a number of jobs that basically were involved in the arts, but not as artists. I worked for CBC, as a, CBC Radio as a trainee radio producer. Um, I did the location sound on a couple of documentaries on Native culture. I um, worked for the Canadian uh, Native Arts Foundation, now called Inspire. Um, I did a whole bunch of different things in the arts. And I ended up working for a television series, um, a 13-part children's television series that was shot in northwestern Ontario. It was called Spirit Bay. And... Um, all the writers, all the directors, all the producers, and half of the cast was non-native. So I went and knocked on their door and I said, hi, I understand you're doing this native series, but you don't have anybody, any native people working in the office. I'm native, why don't you hire me? And they did. And it was an interesting experience. I got to learn a lot about filmmaking, but more importantly, I was given the opportunity. I, what part, one of my jobs was to break down the scripts and, uh, for production. So I would go through these scripts um, and, and break them down. And I learned the structure of a half hour television drama. So that when that series ended through a, a series of circumstances, I found myself chatting. Uh, I was doing an article for adapting native stories into a television film format for a, a magazine. And I ended up talking with all the story producers, story editors on all the television series being shot in Canada at that time. And I ended up talking with this one series and we were chatting away, I was interviewing her and through, I don't even remember how, but one of us suggested I submit some story ideas just for the heck of it. I did and they bought it and lo and behold, I had to write it. So I ended up writing this episode, they liked it, they shot it and it was their season ender. 
So at the age of 25, I wrote an episode of a show called The Beachcombers a thousand years ago. Um, and that was my introduction to writing. And it, for me, it was a case of not so much me finding my art, but my art literally tracked me down, kicked me in the behind and told me you're a writer. So that's how things started for me as a writer. I started out writing for television. I wrote Beachcomber Street Legal, North of 60, all back then. And then something interesting was happening. Around the late 80s, the contemporary native literary and theatrical renaissance was happening. At least that's what I call it. This little play called The Red Sisters premiered in downtown Toronto and in my opinion revolutionized the larger Canadian um, indigenous literary community. So this play was produced and it started a revolution. Suddenly out of nowhere, native theater and native literature became popular, became very, very in vogue. And it, it, you have to understand what a revolution this was because this was 1986. And when this play premiered, you have to understand, right? It's written by an unknown playwright, an unknown, unknown Cree playwright named Thompson Highway in an an unconventional theater environment called the Native Canadian Centre. And it was about, um, basically the plot line was seven Indigenous women want to go to, um, one second please, thank you. Uh, seven Indigenous women want to go to the world's largest bingo game in Toronto, Ontario. That's essentially the plot. And um, so technically, if you take a look at everything, it should not have been successful. But and, and during that the first week or two of the run, it wasn't. Um, there are wonderful stories of Thompson and Elaine Bombery, the arts manager, having to go out on the street and give away free tickets because nobody was coming to see the show. But it was such a, a, a it was such a revolutionary way in storytelling. Um, you know, there's a whole number of reasons I can give you the fact that there's no central character within the native community, right? No one person is more important than the other. The community is more important than the individual. So every character in that play and its sequel, uh, Dried Up, Sudden, Move to Campus Casing, are equally important. They all have their own story within the context of the play. And so the play became incredibly successful. By the end of the run, it was standing room only. And the play went on to, to uh, I think it was nominated for like three major awards. Um, the Chalmers Award, the Governor General's Award, and the Dora Maver Moore Award. And I think it won two of the three. I'm not sure which ones. But, so this, the doors went open. And all of a sudden, the, the Canadian theater-going public became very interested in how and what Native people had to tell. And, 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 and share in their storytelling tradition. So, um, and, and what became even more interesting is the fact that for a period of time, theater became basically the medium of expression for a lot of indigenous people for a very specific reason. Theater is the next logical progression of oral storytelling. It's basically taking people on a journey using your mind, your body and your voice and I grew up surrounded by storytelling and most native people did. Now, um, so when it came to telling, telling stories, basically you're going from around the campfire, around the kitchen table to basically on a, on a thrust stage with a proscenium march. Basically that's it. Once you understood the structure of a play and the thing about theater is the structure can often be bent to suit the needs of the play. So suddenly, all these and, and the other interesting thing being um, why it was so successful and why a lot of indigenous people uh, embraced theater was um, prose, nonfiction, uh, writing, uh, all that sort of stuff often re required an, an understanding, a, a, a very specific, very strong, very detailed understanding of how the English language works, right? And a lot of us, because of our education, um, weren't really that comfortable writing in English. Uh, I have 33 published book, books, and to this day, I still do not know what a dingling participle or split infinitive is. So, but, but theater was about how people talked. And that whole thing about oral storytelling, right, it is how people talk. 
And one of the problems of first time playwrights um, is the fact that all their characters sound alike. They, you know, they're, they're all basically given different names, but if you put all their lines up together, they all basically sound alike. And we all know, you know, two, four, six, ten people say the same thing, the same reason, the same way. But because we had that background in oral storytelling, we know different people could tell the same story different ways. And that sort of sunk into our unconsciousness. Thompson, as a way of making his characters sound different, because he's also a classically trained pianist, um, gives his characters a different type of music. And when he's writing their dialogue, he thinks like that music. So some are very fast and staccato, others are very slow and lubrigous, lubrigous, whatever he's, the word is. And um, and so, the, so because of our background, we understood how characters talk differently. So suddenly there's this explosion of native theater and all these stories are being told. And one of the interesting things I discovered at, at, in this early age, because by this time, um, as I said, I was still young. I was lurching from job to job. I had a very hungry landlord that liked to be fed on a regular basis. And while writing for television was fun and lucrative at its time, basically I was doing one a year, which did not one or two a year, which was not exactly filling my bank book. So I was looking, I was always a freelancer looking for work somewhere, anywhere to pay the rent and buy, buy my craft dinner. And I got a call from Thompson Highway. Um, at that time, as, as it was exploding, there were still only two working native playwrights in Ontario. And he'd gotten a grant from the from um, the Ontario Arts Council for a playwright in residence. So he basically called me up and asked me if I wanted to be the writer in residence for Native Earth. I said no, primarily because I did not know anything about theater. I thought theater and theater artists were pretentious. Um, but... I needed the money. I, I had that hungry landlord that needed to be taken care of. And I was between contracts and I said, sure. Uh, Thompson cheated. Basically when I said no, he came back and said, look at it this way, Drew. It's 20 weeks work. You sit through the, you sit through two rehearsals of two plays, maybe write a play at the end of it. And you get a check every week for 20 weeks. And I said, when do I start? So that's my glorious introduction to the world of theater. Um, but while I was there, I decided if I'm going to work in this industry, I want to know what the heck I'm doing and what the heck these people are, 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 are saying out there. And I began to read all the plays that were happening in the country at that time. And I tried to see as many Native plays as I could. And I found something really interesting, really astonishing. Almost all the plays and novels coming out of the First Nations community in the late 80s and 90s and still to this day, vast majority of them were dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. Almost all the characters were either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. And it, a lot of the theater dealt with the dysfunctional aspect of the First Nations community. And this made perfect sense. I totally understand it. Because essentially, when an oppressed people get their voice back, they're going to write about being oppressed. And Native people had just come through... Uh, three, four, 500 years of colonization, um, racism, uh, residential schools, reserves, etc. They were annoyed, they were pissed off and they wanted people to know that. So um, I remember having a conversation with Maori writers and uh, Aborigine writers from Australia and uh, writers from uh, the, the Americas, indigenous writers. And it became very apparent that you know, when you've been at the bottom of the social hierarchy, whether it's been for a couple hundred years like the Americas or a couple thousand years like in India um, um, with the Dalits, um, basically when you get to when you get your voice back and you get to write, chances are you won't write a comedy. And this goes back to actually a statement Thompson says in uh, I think it's an essay in Dried Up Sudden Move to Capus Casing, the published version, where he says before the humor can take place, the poison must be exposed. So that's what was happening during that first generation of writers. The poison was being exposed. Native people were pissed off and they wanted to share that. They wanted to expose it. They wanted to let the world know what they had survived. 
So all these novels were coming out. And they basically had three narratives. They were historical narratives. They were narratives, uh, victim narratives, or dealing with the byproducts of what I refer to as post-contact stress disorder. And I'm in the middle of this, and I'm watching all this, and I understood it, and it made perfect sense, but they all began to, began to sound like you'd get a script, and you'd think, oh, I wonder what, what happened, to what, what horrible things happened to this character, or to this, in this play. Um, and I began to sort of think, you know, I would look at my mother. My mother was a very strong woman with an amazing sense of humor, and my mother was not oppressed, depressed, or separatist, and I wasn't really seeing these people on stage. It was all the darker aspects of the First Nations community. And I didn't re I didn't know if I was interested really in doing dark and depressing theater. So I didn't know what to do. I was in I was in a bit of a quandary. And I found myself on the Blood Reserve in Alberta talking with an elder from the Blood Reserve about this and he said that in his opinion for native people humor is the wd-40 of healing i heard that humor is the wd-40 of healing i thought that was great i liked it it was true it was so it was so cool i thought it was t-shirt worthy so and it went it went with thompson's uh, saying before the healing can take place the poison must be exposed and humor is the WD-40 of healing. So I was more interested in helping with the healing than exposing the poison. Both absolutely valid. Um, there, were, there were many more, uh, much more talented writers than me who were exploring, uh, exposing the, um, the poison. So I decided to embrace humor. I decided, like I have been very fortunate to have traveled to over 150 First Nation communities all across Canada and the States. And everywhere I've been, I've been greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. All right. And as I said, I wasn't really seeing this in our literature. So um, I decided I wanted to do this. So I started writing, keeping in mind the spirit of our humor. I wanted to celebrate Indigenous humor. So I started writing humorous articles and essays for various magazines and newspapers. One of my most famous pieces is one called Pretty Like a White Boy, which, which dealt with what it was like growing up being a fair-skinned Indigenous person like myself. Um, and uh, so I wrote a comedy, my very first play, uh, my second play. My first play was a YA novel, Young Audiences, which had a lot of humor in it. It was called, um, uh, no, so it was called, Toronto at Dreamers Rock. But my first two act adult play was called The Bootlegger Blues. And it was about a 58 year old good Christian Ojibwe woman who through a series of circumstances finds herself in possession of 143 cases of beer that she has to bootleg in order to buy an organ for the church. And it's loosely based on a true story. So I started writing, I, I wrote that and it was very, very popular. And I ended up writing for what I call the blues quartet. They are just mere, mere celebrations of the indigenous sense of humor. And I used to say with absolutely no socially redeeming qualities whatsoever. I was young at the time and I didn't realize that the very fact that I was writing indigenous comedies was a political statement in itself saying we laugh, we have a right to laugh and uh, we have a sense of humor because all those stories of the stoic Indian, the tragic Indian, were like out there, but were not true. I have seen, I have been a part of too many um, circles of laughter to even contemplate that being a reality. So suddenly I was writing these comedies and I was writing dramas too. I write four types of plays, theater for young audiences, which have a lot of humor in them. I write dramas, which have a lot of humor in them. And I write comedies, which have a lot of drama in them. And I write what I refer to as intellectual satires, which at the core, there's something important there but it's wrapped in satire and irony so um i started doing this and I, and and it was really interesting to do because at some point i got a little criticism i got a little flack because many people believed native theater and literature its responsibility was to push the envelope was to make the audience uncomfortable was to ask difficult questions and um 
some native theater, definitely, definitely. But I didn't understand how, why that couldn't be done without the inclusion of humor. Because to me, I don't, th I think uh, I, there was somebody in the States once said, one of the best ways to know a people is through what makes them laugh. And that was very important to me. Now I'm drawing to a close here and I was asked to comment about motorcycles and, or not motorcycles and sweetgrass, um, cottagers and Indians. Now cottagers and Indians is an example of that. It's a, it's a, it's a play that explores the Minoman conflict on the course of the lakes between the cottage industry and permanent residents and the indigenous people. And it's just a different perspective on this thing known as wild rice. And I mean, I grew up there. I knew all about it. And I even wrote an article for a Toronto magazine called Now Magazine on it I, several years ago. And the artistic director of a theater company called Tarragon Theater um, was sitting in a cafe in New York City. And he was reading an article in some international magazine about it. I mean, it was such an issue that it made the international papers. And he was reading it and he got intrigued by it. And he said, wait a minute, I know somebody who's from that area me and he sent me an email saying do you think this would make for an interesting play and my first reaction was no because i've been there so long and I, I i the old saying i couldn't see the forest for the trees and he uh, um and i just said what's in, what's dramatically interesting about a bag of wild rice and he told me to, to, to try and put on my objectivity glasses um think about it look at the issues and i did and by golly he was right it was a play it was already there as a play the issues the characters etc so I sat down, I wrote it, um, it just poured out of me. Uh, I knew the characters, I knew the situation. And um, through this bizarre circumstance, it actually went up in about a year's time, or less than a year. Usually plays have like, I don't know, uh, 16 months to two years of development before it can be fit into a studio, into a theater, because the theater has to plan for a year to raise the money, do the publicity, and uh, takes a year of development, et cetera, et cetera. But he had a cancellation and he had faith in the piece. So he said, let's do it. I said, let's do it. We did it. And it ran for five weeks at Terragon Theater in Toronto, and it was sold out for four of those five weeks. So um, some of the people who came to see that play were some producers I'd worked with on an earlier documentary called Searching for Winnetou, about the German fascination with North American indigenous people. Absolutely bizarre. I've been to Germany 19 times. They are just infatuated with, with indigenous people, or specifically indigenous people from the 1880s. Some of them don't think we have uh, evolved beyond then. Anyways, the producers who I'd worked with on that came and saw the play with, at that time, the head of the CBC documentary development they saw it and they saw it as a documentary and they approached me afterwards we talked about it and we went out and shot it using the title for both doc for the documentary and the play but it was more than just a documentary about the wild rice issue we used it sort of as a springboard to discuss sort of indigenous non-indigenous people's conflicts over land and water issues. So we went across the country and talked with people who, who, were, who were dealing with this, some well, some not so well. And uh, we did it as a documentary. Um, and to me, it's one of those good examples of how you started, at first I dealt with it through humor. The play is not really a comedy, but it's very comedic in places. And in the documentary, there's a little bit of humor here or there, but it's, it's basically a serious look at the issue. And um, I often use my writing and in situations like this as windows, but also it's a way for both sides to look at each other and understand what's going on. When I was writing the play, I tried to be equal. If I write somebody who's evil from the first page and then evil on the last page, there's no growth in the character. Uh, same whether they're native or non-native. So in the context of the play, right? They have to be three-dimensional characters. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to be evil today, or I'm going to, you know, some people may say I'm going to be hundred percent good, but we know how often that happens. Um, so when I was putting the play together, I had to be able to show gray. Real drama exists in the gray, not in the black and white. 
and then within the documentary, you can see the black and white. You can see both sides have a very uh, have an issue. They both embrace. They both want to fight for. And this is in all the different places we go to in that documentary. And I, I tried to present. I not I. Our film crew tried to present sort of realistic and honest examples of the issues being done. Anyways, I think I'm coming to the end here and uh, I hope this was all fine and dandy and everybody had a good time. Uh, I forget what, I don't, it's 1230. I have reached the end of my uh, my time here. Okay, see you, bye. No, I'm just kidding. We have, we do have some, some uh, sorry, I'm gonna let Sherry in real quick. And if we can just hold on to you for just like two, two questions. Drew, you're awesome. Like, yeah. I, like we need you back. Okay. So we're mm -hmm. gonna we're we're gonna hold you to that, okay? Because in Halton, we promote you anywhere we can. We love what you do. Uh, this is one of our teachers, and he's the one that that Sherry had mentioned earlier in the back room about uh, motorcycles and sweet sweet grass. So this is his question to you. Can you read it? Or do you yes, need glasses? Right in the okay. middle of reading motorcycles and sweetgrass. Is there anything you could say to them to help them or frame their experience with attack? This is actually quite funny and quite uh, coincidental and ironic. When I leave here, I'm going down to a studio. I'm doing the audio version of the book right oh. now. I'm doing the vo I'm doing the voice a voice. I'm recording it. That's awesome. Nice. And yesterday. I got an, uh, an email from three students from a high school in Alberta saying, uh, just wait a minute, let me, let me, let me find it here. I've got, to, I've got to read this to you. Um, uh, just wait a second. Yes, I got an I got a email from three students, high school students in Alberta saying, not an email, sorry, a, yes, an email, and I tweeted this out. Um, they basically were asking me, the author, What's the theme of the book? Why did John have so many last names? Was John intended to be a good character or the villain? Um, and about three or four other different different questions too. And I'm sitting there going, you know, aren't, am I like I I appreciate their chutzpah for ask going to the author and asking, but I'm thinking, is this is this copacetic? Is this uh, kosher? Um, I just basically told, I gave him some some suggestions. Um, so. In terms of this particular question, um, let me just say one thing. First of all, the last names of John, they're not random. They all have a purpose. They'll have an origin. They'll have a certain irony to them. A comment on, um, on, uh, on uh, co colonization and racism. So be sure to look at that. They're not just random names. That's awesome. Yeah, that is so good because I know that the one teacher, um, and I think he's going to try and get a hold of you um, to come and talk to their students. And uh, but he's he's just uh, brings so much life to the class when when especially when he's talking about your books um, and have and having those uh, having those teachers in there because I know who you know. I'm now I'm going to go back and read his last names because I know that I know the plot of the story and I've I've read the book. <laughs> Um, and, and then it was one of those things that you mentioned earlier, beachcombers. Now we're really dating ourselves. I think Jody doesn't even remember beachcombers. <laughs> Her mom would. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it was amazing, you know, to, to even see some of those stories back in the day with beachcombers and some of the issues that they took on, which was very, very challenging and very, and, and very good on CBC for, for having those, um, try, trying to have those conversations. Now you mentioned something, um, just quickly, and if I can ask you this, <clears throat> you mentioned something too about being, um, you know, a light-skinned Indigenous person, and we have we're having an awful lot of those conversations in our community, and we keep on going back to the very same thing that you know we we come in all just like First Nations, Métis, Inuit, we are all different, come in different sizes and shapes and colors, and uh, but we, you know, but we still have that connection to our community, unlike you know certain. Unlike other people um, who have pretended to be indigenous, and once they're found out that they're pretending to be indigenous, we we know what happens, um, you know. And so I don't know if you want to just kind of take a little bit of time just to talk about that, just the pretend Indian piece a little bit, if you don't mind. Pretendians. Um, Pretendian. 
my my standard joke that I've been doing for 30 years is that in fact I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian. So technically that makes me an occasion. <laughs> as far as I like to say a special occasion, if not a memorable occasion. Um but yeah, I did I, I I've written about that before. I mean I I don't know, somebody at somebody wanted to sort of do an um an identity accuracy act. They wanted to get the government to pass one, but it's like, how do you do that? In fact, there is already one out there now called the Indian Act. So it's um so I don't I don't know, you know, what do they say? Um there are three ways, uh or three or four ways we in the native community identify each other or say we can claim indigenous heritage. Um we can we ha- um self-identify. We are uh, the community self identity or the community acknowledges us, and um, we can trace our lineage back to a specific community. And there's technically a fourth one, adoption. Though some people sort of uh, wonder about the, the the specifics of that one. So I think those are a good beginning to look at because I think what where this whole pretendian thing happened was um, when people could not trace their ancestry back to a specific community or a specific people. And I think that those are all things to keep in mind uh, as you're going along. I'm very uncomfortable sort of putting, laying down the hammer about um, who is and who isn't. I mean, I often say about myself, I'm um, biracial, but uni, unicultural, right? I'm half native, half white, but I have absolutely no connection to my white half. My father took off before I was born. So I was raised on the reserve with my mother and my mother's family. And that's the only environment I have. So I see some people talk about, uh, you know, they're half this and half European. Um, I sometimes say that, but, uh, you know, I have, I, I don't, I don't know anything about being white um, for what it's worth. Yeah. And that's, and that's the same with me. My, my mom came, comes from uh, her community is Mistawasis in Saskatchewan. And uh, and I have you know I'm I'm um, you know card carrying uh, and uh, but no, you know that's the same with yeah <laughs> and you know and that's the same with me like I didn't know my father he passed away long way before like before I was like when I was born um, and he passed away so my mom was the one that raised me so even though I have those two in identities it's where I where I identify more with my mom um, but yes thank you I just I, I we don't want to take any more of your time because I have kind of gone over you know 10 more minutes but it's been an absolute pleasure to sit in this room with you to reminisce about some of the some of the career change, career path that you've been on in your timeline and and even going to Germany and and having that fascination for indigenous folk. I went there once too and I just couldn't believe like why is there a teepee here? I don't understand. And then said, why been, is there a headdress? As I said, I've been there 19 times. I did a documentary about it and they keep bringing me back to lecture on native culture. And the irony being I look more German than native. Right. And, you know, and our friends that are uh, that um, they they're a dance troupe called Tribal Vision and they've been going to Germany for years and years and years and they have a great big celebration. And they, yeah, it's just a huge thing. Um, but it is just amazing, too, because um, that fascination, from my understanding, started with that author, Carl May and uh, and where he went. And I remember my father in law, who was in um growing up in Norway would have the books underneath his underneath his uh, textbook and reading uh, Carl May's book and that, that whole fascination about indigenous or Indians, uh, the Hollywood Indians and the romanticized idea of Indians. Um, it really came from him with the whole dress, like his museum. And I'm sure you've been there in Dresden, um, you know, and seeing that whole piece of um, of artifacts in a totally different country. And then of course I come back to the place where, ah, well, I wonder how many, all of those, all of those artifacts I'm sure are stolen um, and should be, you know, most of them should be repatriated back to the community. Just saying, but anyhow, yeah. well, another a discussion. Ironic twist that the museum, the Kralmai Museum in Dresden, um, it's like incredible, it's, it's incredible. One of the things they they own or own I the, don't know if that's terminology, but in their collection are four human scalps that had been donated, and um, a, a, a nation I think I, I'm not sure Lakota some nation in the, in in the in the the plains are trying to get it back, um, but the thing is nobody knows if they're 
white or native scalps. Wow. They're just scalps, <laughs> right? And they're, they're afraid to do, they don't want to do DNA tests because it might strengthen or whatever. So it, it's, it's just a bizarre situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very bizarre. I, I saw that article somewhere. Anyway, mm-hmm. you know what? This is, we could talk with you all day, Drew. I'm just saying. So you're going to have mm-hmm. to hang out with us here. I got to go we'll record have- my novel. Yes, I can't wait. That's going to be my next walking, um, my walking uh, book. Okay, get that on Audible, would you? I'm reading uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed right now. I have to listen to every chapter over three times so I can understand the dialogue and the words. I have to Google. But let me tell you, everybody should reread that book right now because we're about to do that. Mm-hmm. Us oppressed mm-hmm. people in Halton are about to- <laughs> are about to be doing making some crazy waves here. Anyway, you're awesome, awesome Drew. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sherry, mm-hmm. you're awesome too. All as of these viewers. As we say in my reserve, grazie. <laughs> <laughs> and I may have to tweet about this. Yes, yes, definitely do. You going native? Let's go. I want to see that. See mm-hmm. the this one. Let's go. Have a All great right day. Bye bye. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.